You know, one of the nice things about doing these videos about different versions of Batman, different creative teams that have worked on Batman in the comics over the years, different variations of Batman that have been made is all the comments I get from people who offer up their own picks for best Batman ever. As you might expect, since Batman's been around for over 80 years, there's a lot of diversity of opinion. And that's just what it is. Opinion. Taste. Personal preference. It's art. Batman is art. I didn't say good art, necessarily. And art is subjective. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. We can talk about it. We can argue about it. But hopefully it's all for the sake of good fun and good conversation. There is one particular version of Batman, however, about which I think there can be no argument. Of course, there will be, because this is the internet, and what else are we going to do? But I think there is a very strong case to be made that the Batman I'm going to talk about in this video is, if not the best Batman ever, because, you know, opinions vary, at least the most important Batman ever. Who is this most crucial of crime fighters, this caped crusader of considerable consequence? Find out right now. Batman, starring Adam West in the title role with Burt Ward as Batman's loyal sidekick Robin, and as we would learn decades later when Ward published his autobiography, Adam West's real-life wingman, debuted on ABC in January 1966. It was unlike any superhero adaptation ever made. There had been live-action superheroes on TV and in the movies, of course. The Adventures of Superman show starring George Reeves and Noel Neal had ended production eight years earlier and was still popular in reruns. There had even been live-action adaptations of Batman in the form of a pair of movie serials released in 1943 and 1949, respectively, but none that had the particular approach to the material as the 1966 Batman show. As cheesy as many of them were, the major live-action superhero adaptations produced prior to Batman 66 mostly played things straight, there were plenty of light moments in the George Reeves Superman show, but it was an action-adventure show, not a comedy. And initially, that was the plan for Batman as well. A live-action Batman TV series had bounced around Hollywood since the early 1960s, and when the project finally landed at 20th Century Fox and William Dozier's Greenway Productions, the expectation was that the show would be similar to other popular action-adventure shows of the time, such as The Man from U.N.C.L.E. or The Wild Wild West. Producer William Dozier had other plans, as it turns out. When 20th Century Fox gave the project to his production company, Dozier had never read a comic book. So he did some research. Remember, this is the mid-1960s. The latter portion of the Silver Age of Comics, things weren't quite as outlandish in the pages of DC Comics in the mid-60s as they had been in the 50s, but they were still pretty goofy. After reading a few issues of Batman and Detective Comics, Dozier became convinced that the only way his show could work and remain faithful to the comics would be to play the material as comedy. Dozier and his writers crafted a colorful, action-packed, and extremely tongue-in-cheek take on Batman. The most important of the show's writers was Lorenzo Semple Jr., who wrote the pilot and would eventually write 16 episodes of the show in total, plus the feature film based on the series that I'll get to in a minute. It was Semple as much as Dozier who set the tone for the show, writing ridiculous stories where everything, no matter how outrageous, was presented with an absolutely straight face. That uncrackable facade of seriousness is the reason why I have been able to enjoy this show since I was a child, albeit in multiple, hugely different modes. See, when I first discovered this version of Batman in reruns when I was a kid, I was too young and naive to get the joke. I took the show to be what it superficially presented itself as, an action-adventure where Batman and Robin solved crimes, fought bad guys, and escaped fiendishly designed death traps. Even as a teenager, when I'd occasionally catch an episode on TV land or something, I took the show at face value. I was deep into my cynical, self-serious, adolescent Batman fandom, so I would never have called myself a fan of 
Batman 66. It was the 90s, and my Batman was monochromatic and violent, and that's how I liked it. But eventually, I came to regard Batman 66 as enjoyable in a so-bad-it's-good kind of way. It wasn't until I rediscovered the show as an adult that I realized it wasn't funny by accident. It was funny on purpose. The deadpan seriousness, the presentation of the absurd as though it were the mundane, that was the joke. The show wasn't so bad it's good. It was just good. Good in a way that I hadn't been able to perceive as a child oblivious to irony and a teenager too zealously attached to his preferred grim version of Batman to recognize that other interpretations might have value as well. When I started watching the show again as a grown-up, I was initially taken aback by how incredibly funny it is. It's not just a zany bit of fun. At its best, it's absolutely hilarious. And standing in the center of it all is the key to that hilarity. Batman himself. Adam West. When people talk about the greatest actors to play superheroes in live-action movies and on TV, there are names that come up again and again. With Superman, there's Christopher Reeve, of course. Wonder Woman, you've got Linda Carter. Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire. I mean, come on. Side note, if the new Spider-Man movie is really going to do the multiverse thing and Toby's not in it, I'm lighting my theater seat on fire. Just fair warning. But for Batman, it's a little more complicated. The argument over who's the best live-action version of Batman usually reduces down to a choice between Michael Keaton and Christian Bale, which is totally fair. I'll just go ahead and tell you. Their versions of Batman are both going to be subjects of future videos in this series, but it also speaks to the favoritism shown toward the more serious takes on the character. Because here's the thing, yeah, Michael Keaton and Christian Bale were both fantastic as Batman, each in their own way, but so was Adam West in his own way. And even though he is often overlooked in this conversation, he deserves a spot on the list. And one close to the top if you please. In fact, one could argue, and by one I mean me, and by could argue I mean am arguing right now, that West's Batman was more important to his series than Keaton and Bale were to their movies, because West's specific performance did so much to define the voice of that show. As played by Adam West, Batman is not quite the specimen of physical perfection as in the comics and later live-action portrayals, but, you know, he's fit in a dad-who-jogs sort of way. More importantly, he's the ultimate straight arrow. He knows all the rules, he follows all the rules, he is totally on the level and utterly incorruptible. Even the aspects of Batman's character that seem unavoidably suspect, like the fact that he hides his identity with a mask and is out there fighting crime despite not actually being a cop, are reframed within the show to emphasize rather than detract from his legitimacy. As Commissioner Gordon would be the first to tell you, Batman's mask is the very thing that allows him to do what he does, and what he does is very necessary work indeed. Nothing unseemly about it whatsoever. And before you attempt to dismiss or discredit the caped crusader as some sort of vigilante who has taken the law into his own hands, you should know that Batman and Robin are both duly deputized agents of the law. Their actions taken to assist the Gotham City Police Department are properly authorized and carried out within the bounds of the law. West's performance, and by extension, the show, finds that point of tension between the perception of Batman and the would-be reality of Batman and never stops leaning on it. If Batman or someone very much like him existed in the real world, he would be viewed as an outlaw and a crackpot and someone who was just as dangerous and detrimental to society as those he pursued. He's a guy who takes it upon himself to dress up in a costume and catch criminals. But in this show, Batman is one of Gotham City's leading citizens, regarded almost universally by everyone except the villains as a role model and paragon of virtue whose participation in official police investigations is never questioned and is, in fact, eagerly welcomed. Batman's moral rectitude doesn't stop at upholding the law. As a parental figure to Robin, Batman often dispenses wisdom and instruction in the form of brief, pious homilies about the importance of honesty, hard work, and obeying traffic laws, 
West delivers all of this shamelessly corny dialogue with a matter-of-fact earnestness and uncrackable straight face that would make Leslie Nielsen in Airplane jealous. It's a perfect performance. And it has to be, because if West lets us in the audience know, even for a moment, that he's in on the joke, the whole thing falls apart. But of course, as good as his performance is, and as crucial as it is to establishing and maintaining the voice and the tone of the series, Adam West isn't carrying the show all by himself. The other cast members clearly understand the assignment as well, starting with Burt Ward, whose characterization as Robin has been a punchline for 50 years running, which just goes to show how good he is, because that's the whole point of his version of Robin. Burt Ward's Robin is this enthusiastic, energetic, though not terribly worldly, um, kid. Ward himself was 20 when Batman premiered. Robin is supposed to be somewhere in his mid-teens, I think. Not that his exact age really matters. His role in the series is clear. Just as Batman is the impossibly square costumed superhero, Robin is the spunky young sidekick with the volume turned all the way up. Whereas West's Batman is deliberate and unflappable even in the face of certain doom, when he's been tied to a giant barbecue grill, for instance, Ward's Robin is impetuous, vibrating with youthful exuberance, communicating mostly through exclamations which he punctuates with a punch of his fist into his palm. He's sometimes reckless. He can get carried away or be misled by his inexperience or his raging emotions, but he's always willing to be corrected by his senior partner, acknowledging his mistake with a humble, gosh, Batman, you're right. True, the endurance of this particular characterization has made it difficult for some audience members, and also some writers, to take Robin seriously when he's presented in a less comedic way, even today, Burt Ward's Robin remains the default version of the character in the minds of many people. In that way, he's arguably been even more long-lasting than West's Batman, and every attempt to depict the character in a more dramatic light has felt, at least to some degree, like a reaction to Burt Ward's Robin, or sometimes an overreaction, as in the case of the live-action Titan series, which tries to make us forget about the 60s version of the character by making Dick Grayson into, you know, a murderer. Holy overcompensation, Batman! By the way, my favorite holy something Batman line is from Hot Off the Griddle, that aforementioned episode where Batman and Robin are tied to that giant grill. Catwoman informs the dynamic duo that when the sun passes overhead and its rays are intensified by the giant magnifying glasses trained on them, they'll be cooked alive. And, to aid the process, they've been coated with margarine, in response to which Robin groans, holy oleo. Expanding beyond Batman and Robin, the rest of the cast is pitch perfect as well. Alan Napier as the faithful Alfred, Neil Hamilton as the most delightfully clueless and useless version of Commissioner Gordon ever, Stafford Rep as Chief O'Hara, the guy Commissioner Gordon talks to when Batman's not around, Madge Blake as Aunt Harriet, the woman who never heard a transparently fabricated alibi she didn't instantly believe, all pitch perfect, and those are just the regulars. We can't forget about the guest villains. Much like Burt Ward's Robin, which defined the character in the minds of most casual fans for decades, many of the villains who appeared on Batman 66 became the definitive versions of those characters as well. Until Jack Nicholson took the role for the 1989 Batman feature film, Cesar Romero owned the Joker. Other villains from the show continue to dominate the perception of those characters. All due respect to Danny DeVito, but I think no one has yet displaced Burgess Meredith as the Penguin, at least in the eyes of the public. And many casual fans and diehards alike, including those my age and younger who weren't around when the show originally aired, still think of Julie Newmar as the Catwoman. And if not her, then her successor in the role, Eartha Kitt. And, come on, do I even need to point out how much Jim Carrey's version of the Riddler is influenced by Frank Gorshin? As a matter of fact, do I even need to point out how much Jim Carrey's entire comic persona is influenced by Frank Gorshin? The villains on Batman 66 have been extremely influential, is what I'm saying. Moving beyond the characters, how can you not love 
this version of the Batmobile. It fits the aesthetic of the show perfectly, and it's incredibly cool in its own right. Even many of those who aren't the biggest fans of this show feel compelled to bend the knee to this absolute automotive icon. William Dozier and his fellow creators also used the format of their show to satirize superhero comics and other forms of adventure fiction as well. Perhaps the show's best-known trope, other than maybe Robin's wholly wacky but appropriate reference shtick, is the use of cliffhanger endings, a la old-school movie serials. For the first two seasons, Batman aired two episodes per week. The conclusion of the first episode invariably finds the dynamic duo snared in some diabolical death trap. As they struggle against certain doom, we are implored to tune in for the conclusion tomorrow. Same bat time. Same bat channel. In place of the comic's breathlessly worded captions, which summarized previous events, moved the plot along when necessary, and implored readers to be sure and buy the next issue, Batman 66 had a narrator, actually William Dozier himself, who perfectly captured the overwrought, at times borderline hysterical tone of those captions, performing his narration with the animated bombast of a highly caffeinated old-school news anchor. The series premiered as a mid-season replacement in January 1966 and was an immediate smash hit. Two months after the first episode aired, Adam West was on the cover of Life magazine. That summer, a little over a month before the premiere of the show's second season, a feature film based on the series was released. The film opened July 30th, 1966, but had only just been announced the previous March, two weeks after that Batman issue of Life magazine hit the streets, in fact. Lorenzo Semple Jr. banged out the script in a week and a half, and principal photography was completed in less than a month. So, yeah, it was a bit of a rush job, and yet you can't argue with results. Batman the Movie, as it's usually called, is fantastic, as good as or better than the best episodes of the TV series. Cesar Romero, Burgess Meredith, and Frank Gorshin all co-starred as Joker, Penguin, and Riddler, respectively, and Lee Merriweather subbed for Julie Newmar as Catwoman and did a very fine job indeed. Some of the best-loved bits from this version of Batman come from the movie, including Batman's use of bat shark repellent and the comedic high point of the entire series, Batman's ludicrously protracted attempt to dispose of a gigantic cartoon explosive while racing back and forth on a busy pier, pausing just long enough at one point to frustratedly observe, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. The movie did okay at the box office. It wasn't a smash hit, but it broke even. However, the show's ratings began to drop during the second season. By the third season, despite having been a bona fide cultural phenomenon less than two years before, the series was on the brink of cancellation. The broadcast schedule was scaled back to one episode per week, and the cliffhangers were largely abandoned. In an effort to reinvigorate the series, Dozier asked the editor of the Batman comics, Julie Schwartz, to create the character of Batgirl, which Schwartz, along with writer Gardner Fox and artist Carmine Infantino, did. Batgirl debuted in the January 1967 issue of Detective Comics and joined the TV series the following September, where she was played by Yvonne Craig. By the way, not only can we thank the 60s Batman show and William Dozier for Batgirl, we can also thank him for Alfred. Julie Schwartz had killed Alfred off in the comics, but Dozier wanted to use him in the show, so he asked Schwartz to bring him back. I did a whole video about that. You should check it out if you haven't watched it. Or even if you have watched it. It's a good video. Anyway, unfortunately, the addition of Batgirl wasn't enough to rescue the series from cancellation, and the third season of Batman would be the last. But as was the case with Star Trek, which was being produced at the same time, Batman 66 found a second, much longer life in off-network syndication, where reruns of its 120 episodes became a staple for decades. When I was a kid, there were at least three local TV stations that aired Batman reruns Monday through Friday, in the mornings or the afternoons, usually in one-hour blocks. So you got the cliffhanger and the resolution in the same day. It was great. 
God, remember before everything was on DVD or streaming, when if you wanted to watch something, you had to wait for it to come on? How do we ever survive? Beginning in the early 1970s, the Batman comics started to move away from the silly Silver Age stuff that inspired the TV series towards something more serious, and in the 1980s this process continued, best exemplified by projects like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, Miller and David Mazzucchelli's Batman Year One, and Alan Moore and Brian Boland's The Killing Joke. But in the minds of people who didn't read the comics, which was most people, Batman remained the campy, over-the-top goof that he was presented as on TV in the 60s. When Batman appeared in projects outside the comics throughout the 1970s and 80s, he was almost invariably characterized in a way that was very similar to his portrayal in the 1960s TV series. In fact, sometimes, specifically for 1977's The New Adventures of Batman and, beginning in 1984, the last two versions of Super Friends, Adam West himself returned to voice the character. This version of the character was THE version of the character for over 20 years. The modern age Dark Knight interpretation didn't become the dominant version of the character as far as popular culture was concerned until the release of Tim Burton's Batman movie in 1989. That long-lasting and far-reaching influence is why I say this Batman, Batman 66, the Adam West Batman, is quite possibly the most important version of the character. It's sometimes claimed that the Batman TV series saved the comic books from cancellation, and while sales of Batman comics did see a massive uptick during the show's phenomenally successful first season, it's not true that the comics were on the verge of cancellation before the show started. It is probably true that the comics which directly inspired the show saved the Batman line from being cancelled by DC because sales were bad and getting worse before Julius Schwartz took over as editor, but that's not the same thing, and it was a few years before the TV show started anyway. What the show did do is elevate Batman from a recognizable comic book character to a universally known pop culture phenomenon. That first wave of Batmania that kicked off in 1966 didn't last long, but it burned bright enough to light the way for the character until the start of the next wave two decades later. This version of Batman might not be your favorite. Then again, it might be. There's been a good deal of positive reappraisal of the 1966 Batman over the last several years, with DC even publishing a comic book set in the world of the show, and Warner Brothers Animation producing a pair of direct-to-video animated movies in the style of the show, featuring the voices of Adam West, Burt Ward, and Julie Newmar. The second one being one of the final projects West completed before he died in 2017 at the age of 88. However you feel about it, and whatever your personal favorite version of the character happens to be, all of us who love Batman owe a debt to Adam West, William Dozier, Lorenzo Semple Jr., and everyone else who brought the 1966 Batman TV series to life. Because before Batman was on the big screen, whipping batarangs, showing his ass, traveling the globe to bring fugitives to justice, or just kind of standing next to his car looking depressed, he was on TV dancing his way to immortality. The Batusi. Best bat dance ever. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting this channel with a monthly donation. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash steveshives, or become a channel member by simply clicking the join button right here on the YouTube page. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.